Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Water Access for a Hydrated Garden. My name is Mara Gittleman. I'm the Workshops and Education Coordinator at NYC Parks Green Thumb. We are the part of the New York City Parks Department that works with over 550 community gardens across the city. So excited to be here with Michaela Elvey from Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, Michaela is an urban garden specialist with Harvest New York, a program of Cornell Cooperative Extension. She provides technical assistance and educational programming for community gardens throughout New York City. Her work primarily focuses on soil health management, urban garden planning and design, and community engagement. Um, we're going to talk about all the different ways garden, urban gardens can access water in the city, um, and Green Thumb will share some information about how to access a fire hydrant here in the five boroughs. Um, if you are just tuning in, we encourage you to please introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to see who's here, where you're coming from, if you're part of a garden, and uh, maybe what you're hoping to learn today. And um, we are recording this session, but we'll have the recording focused on just the speakers. So thanks so much for tuning in, and I'm passing the mic to Michaela. Let me open our presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Mara, for giving me this opportunity. Um, now that you shared, my computer is doing a little thing. So let me go ahead and get started. So you can move to the next slide, Mara. Thank you so mm -hmm. much um, for controlling the slides. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So the introduction was spot on. Um, hi, everybody. I am Michaela Elvey, an urban garden specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, like Mara mentioned, I'm part of the urban ag team in Extension. Um, and I'll talk a tiny bit about Extension in a moment. But ultimately, I want you all to see me as a resource, right? Like I'm a resource to gardeners and growers who may be in need of assistance throughout the season in New York City. Um, I primarily work in the Bronx, Staten Island, and Harlem. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how the team's made up, but that's really the area that I support. Um, funny story, I used to work for the Parks Department for a few years um, as in environmental education, um, but my academic background is a little bit more technical. Um, my degree is in environmental geoscience, which means that I consider um, earth systems as it relates to the geosphere. Um, a lot about minerals, a lot about nutrients over time. When we think about the geologic time scale, right? I also have professional certifications from Cornell in fruit production and soil health, but a lot of my practical experience and background comes from community scale compost processing, environmental justice advocacy, as well as environmental education. So today I'm more than happy to talk about water access. As we know, it's a prevalent challenge in New York City, especially in urban gardens. We can move to the next slide, Mara. So uh, before I get into what Cornell Cooperative Extension means or the work that we do in New York City, I wanna give you an overview of what we're gonna be discussing in today's webinar and what we won't be. So. This presentation is designed to be an entry point and offer some support of the, for those of you who may not know where to begin or are just getting involved with a garden, as well as debunking some myths about rainwater harvesting and the uses of water once you have it. Um, the flow or agenda is on the screen. So we're gonna first talk a little bit about Harvest New York. I'll introduce the program and the team if you're not familiar. Um, considerations for irrigation in urban gardens, um, water access for urban gardens, and some local resources. What we will not be covering is troubleshooting. If you already have existing systems that are set up, um, I can make some recommendations around management. If you're having some challenges, you can shoot me an email, which all of my contact information will be provided. Um, but in this webinar, we will not be troubleshooting existing systems and will not really get into constructing systems. You can move to the next slide. Beautiful. So in the city, Cornell has many programs um, that contribute to New York City in different ways. As part of my program, which is the Harvest New York Urban Agricultural Program, there are four of us who work in the program and serve the greater New York area. 
Within those four, there are two ag specialists, which are focused on production and what that production means. Um, is there the larger farms or gardens that donate or grow over $1,000 worth of produce? And then there are two, myself and another, who are the two garden specialists who support folks that are growing in the city, um, growing crops um, for other purposes, whether they're culturally relevant, whether they're for medicinal value, whether it's to beautify the neighborhood and create access to green space. We know that community gardens fill a bunch of community needs in the neighborhoods where they exist. Um, and so our role is really to support folks that aren't focused on market and production, um, but that want to just upkeep and maintain their spaces so that they can be a resource to the general community. Um, with that being said, I do a lot of technical assistance, um, kind of the role of extension um, as it relates to universities is to provide research, relevant research and targeted research, as well as educational materials and connect what's happening at the university level um, ongoing with folks and practical application in the field. So I, if you have a question that may arise, may arise during the um, growing season, I can support providing some research um, as well as connecting you to more information to, to work through some of those challenges. Um, some topics that we talk about all the time, oh, <laughs> are things like pest and disease, integrated pest management, soil management, and things like that. Structures, maybe trellising, stuff like that. You can go ahead, Mara. <laughs> okay, so water is an essential nutrient for plants. They comprise up to 95% of plant tissues. We know that water is necessary for photosynthesis um, and helping plants grow create their own food. Um, and so most of photosynthesis happens through the, um, through the roots, um, I mean, sorry, through the leaves. Um, and so what helps the process is really if we water the plants, allowing their roots to get all of the oxygen that they need, as well as provide that exchange flow through the roots. It really supports the way that the plants grow. Um, root health, leaf health, leaf health, nutrition is important when growing plants and water is integral to all of the processes, all of the different parts of the plants. Um, they need it throughout the course of their life. Next slide. So when we think about watering and irrigation, in the garden, um, there are a lot of things to consider. Um, so here's just a really brief overview, really brief list, some things to consider. Disease avoidance, we know that growing healthy plants strong, healthy, um, makes them less susceptible to disease, and that goes hand in hand with the pathogen dispersal. Um, when pathogens are present in your system, in your garden, the two ways that they travel, well, three ways really they travel is by water. So the method in which you're watering your plants can carry pathogens, soil. Think about if you were transplanting a crop that might have been exposed to something or not doing well in a spot. Maybe they're, uh, they have some disease that they're interacting with in the soil and then moving that plant could spread it throughout the garden. And then the last way is wind. Um, so, but if we think about water, sometimes the method of watering the plant directly relates to um, whether or not a pathogen is spreading on leaf surface and how far it reaches within your garden. Um, great, so then the next on the list is water frequency. Um, so another thing to consider is how often are you getting to the garden? How often are you able to water um, and managing that process once the season is going? Another thing that you would have to think about when selecting your irrigation is crop selection. We know that some plants need more weather than others, as well as we know they need more space than others, certain ones. And so really understanding what you have growing in your garden, what makes that plant really happy and thrive can help when you're picking your irrigation. Um, labor kind of goes hand in hand with frequency, how many times folks are getting in. If you have more labor, sometimes 
uh, something like a hand watering would be appropriate. But if you have less people interacting, less folks able there to care for the plants that are in the garden, um, then you might consider another system that might be timed or might be kind of a, a you set it the system once and then you have a schedule um, to accommodate for those labor challenges. Um, the other thing that we have to think about is water access, right? Which is the second part of this. How close is the nearest access point to water? What kind of water is it? Um, what's present in that water? Um, and another consideration is what are the channels you need to go through to get access to that water? So um, like Mara mentioned, Alex is gonna go over getting access to a fire hydrant, but that may also look like um, talking to a neighboring building and getting access to one of their spouts to connect a hose. Um, so it can look a couple of different ways. And then the last thing always to consider is cost. Really think about your budget. Really think about what resources are available to you. Um, cost is always something that we consider um, because everything, cost, labor, plant variety, right? If you're buying something that's a little bit, you know, drought resistant, um, the price that that point that it might cost um, and even the different um, parts of your irrigation system all have a cost associated with it. So we can never escape or get away from talking about costs. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So common practices really in community gardens that I see that we know of are the hand watering, the sprinkler systems, and the drip irrigation systems or trickle irrigation systems. Hand watering um, is efficient if it's done properly. <laughs> it could also be time intensive going around and watering each plant, but we know that plants have unique care needs sometimes. And so if you're watering based directly on that plant's needs, it could produce more. Um, and hand watering is an overhead system, but because you are actually doing it, you have control over whether or not you're getting water on the leaves, getting water on the roots where, you know, where you're concentrating that um, to help your plants grow. Um, then the next are just the different types of sprinkler systems, which usually um, have some pressure associated with them. Um, some examples of that are the rotary uh, sprinklers, like those would be the ones that you see for a lawn um, that require less water pressure, but that cover a large area all at once. So if you're thinking about efficiency, maybe that's an option for you setting up a sprinkler system and letting it cover the entire garden, depending on how big some of these spaces are. Um, so that's one other way and very common. Another thing that we see is the trickle or drip irrigation, which is a little bit more involved of a, a system. But I will say that drip irrigation is probably the most efficient system of all. So the principle, of drip irrigation is pretty fairly simple. Um, so the water, once it's you access water, tap it, it would travel through a pipe, tubes, tape underneath the soil surface or right laying right on the soil surface um, and release the water um, through the little outspouts. There's a little image on this slide. So the one in the top right would be an example of like a tape kind of drip irrigation system. And then the one below would be a hand watering system. Drip irrigation is really recommended um, because it is, it's really good for covering a large area all at once from one access point. You set up the system and then from that one access point, you can time or you can um, distribute water over a larger area. Um, and while it is the most efficient, it does have some drawbacks, which we'll discuss in a minute. So next slide. Okay, so just thinking about the pros and cons. So hand watering, again, I said everything has a cost associated with it, right? So if you've got a large area and you're going around hand watering, then it's going to take a lot of time or you need a lot of people to do it well. This is good right? Hand watering is a good way to get water distributed if 
folks are in charge of their individual bed and you're really looking at like a four by eight space that you're hand watering as opposed to a full community garden um, that you're hand watering or a larger space. Um, but again, the cost associated with that would be that it, it's more hands-on, way more active. Sprinkler systems, like I mentioned, do cover really large areas, um, but they're not really as efficient because they can sometimes lead, again, like I said, pathogens can travel on water. And a really easy way to kind of spread that is to cover with the overhead sprinkler really, really far distances. Um, and that would be a cost. So in the picture in here is of a tomato plant with bacterial spot the bacterial leaf spot, which you can see really clearly in this image, which is a pathogen that would travel via water. Um, if you were using a sprinkler system and you were growing tomatoes, that's something to consider. Tomatoes is a very interesting example because airflow is really important when you grow tomato. There's a lot of different consideration when you're growing tomato, but it really does. It, this is a good image to kind of get your mind wrapped around, okay, if I'm spraying overhead, right, and you can't really control and target where that water is going, it can cover the leaves, which we know are super important for photosynthesis and growing the plants and producing that produce. Um, so that's one thing to consider with the sprinkler system. Um, with the drip irrigation system, they can get expensive for a few reasons. Um, one is management, so keeping on top of the, the drip irrigation system, managing that. Also the different parts, so initially getting all the materials to make an irrigation system that's a drip irrigation to cover a large garden could be a little bit costly. More costly, I should say, than hand watering and sprinkler systems because price and cost is subjective. Um, and I put management here also on the slide because depending on how many members your garden has, how many folks are actually managing the space, sometimes, especially when you're using drip irrigation tape, knowing where it is and, and communicating that across garden members can get a little bit tricky. Um, if you laid an irrigation system, because remember they're right on the top of the soil surface or right below the soil surface to work up the most efficiently. And if they're there, and you go to dig something out with a shovel, you could easily snap that irrigation tape. It's something seen time and time again, where you're then replacing parts of this system. If fewer people are in the space and everybody knows where some of those materials are, if you're using something easy to see like white PVC piping, this might not be as considerable, but thinking about all of your materials, thinking about how you're gonna manage it and who's using your space, will really help you determine which system is best for you. Okay, next slide. All right, so let's pivot and talk a little bit about water access. Um, how are we even getting water into the garden? We even, If we got all the irrigation stuff, how are we gonna get the water flowing, right? Um, we definitely need that before we can think about that. And when it comes to water access and what I'm gonna talk about, I want you to take all of the recommendations and suggestions here with a grain of salt, everything has kind of a plus and a minus pros and cons that are associated with it. Um, and you're really going to just have to decide what's best um, for your space, you know, your space best. Um, so these are this whole presentation and this webinar is really, again, that intro level, the brief overview and the broad strokes about options that you have when you're trying to um, hydrate your gardens. So next slide. Okay, so gaining water access. Um, here are some pictures uh, that look at the different systems. So the three main ways that you can gain in the city would be neighboring relationships. So maybe your garden is right behind your school and you know you can just use the, the a hose spigot that's attached to the school. And that's very easy because you're using that type of piping and plumbing system. Um, but 
in a community garden, the building right next door could be residential, it could be commercial. So really having that conversation with your neighbors to gain access um, is something that one should consider. Um, the next is the fire hydrant access permits, which Alex is going to talk a little bit more about um, once I'm done. Um, but that is a resource for you to get municipal water into your gardens, access and tap that at a point, um, which is definitely an option and definitely something that um, should be used. The thing about fire hydrants is where they're located, right? They may not be the closest to your garden. Really, the closest access point might be that neighboring relationship. So even if you're like, oh, I cannot stand this person, fostering a healthy relationship to make the ease of use might be in your benefit. Um, also consider, if you think about the distance from fire hydrants, another thing to consider is how many attachment points are you going to have to have? How long are you going to be tapping that hydrant, right? And trying to create a system that's going to be as efficient for you in your space. And then the last way, which I'm going to talk a little bit more detail in the next slide, is rainwater harvesting. Um, I will be very honest. I took this image from Google, um, and I will source it for you if you like. I don't really know who this person is on the hydrant, but I will say that there was this meme recently going around of Bernie Sanders and the same get up. And so I was like, this speaks to my soul. I need to share this image. It's amazing because I like to imagine that, uh, <laughs> that we're getting some of that uh, action. Um, so next slide. So rainwater harvesting is great. It has amazing environmental benefits from diverting water that's entering the city um, and taking it out of the sewage system and making it useful. Um, so that's one environmental benefit of diverting water. Um, and the amount that a rain barrel can actually divert is amazing. So if we consider how fast rainfall happens. It happens at approximately um, an eighth of an inch per hour, um, which means after a full day of rain, which we definitely get some downpours in the city, then um, you'll get a significant amount of water in your system. Once that reaches one inch, right, so after eight hours, a lot of the calculations are for rainwater harvesting systems on a building or on a structure that you'll find as you do a lot more research, as opposed from just like in the sky, what happens if I just have a rain barrel? How much am I gonna capture then? Because um, surface area is super important to the amount of water that's entering. But if you did think about it at that ratio, after eight hours, you could get up to 600 gallons of water if you have an 1,000 square foot roof, easy math here, but um, that's something to consider and really paints a picture of the impact that having rainwater and rainwater harvesting systems has on, on your garden. Um, typically what I see when I go out to gardens is that rain barrels are between 50 to 60 gallons of water. So considering how that's gonna show up at your site, um, is, is important? Do you need multiple? Do you need them in different locations throughout the garden to make sure that folks have ease of use? Um, rainwater is also super good for gardens because it's considered soft water, meaning that it doesn't have um, a lot of the salt in the water that would happen as if you were drinking from your pipes. If anybody has any pets, they say, leave the water out so the chlorine evaporates when it gets to room temperature, lower that salt and be safe for animals. Similarly, we are animals, right? So uh, one of the benefits is that it's considered soft water. That doesn't mean it's pollution free. It just means that it doesn't have those high concentrations of salt, that you're not adding that to your system. Salt has a tendency to build up in soils. And so when you have a high soil content, usually they say high salt content in your soil, usually dilution is the solution to the problem. And so flushing it out and draining it, um, rainwater, you don't have those same considerations as if you were using municipal water. Um, okay, next slide. So 
Location is important. Size and number of barrels is important. Surface area is in reducing the contamination. So I'm gonna talk about these each individually. Um, there is a lot of research that backs having a rain barrel next to a slope surface. Again, that surface area, even a large one, a roof, um, will allow you to fill up a barrel faster um, as opposed to catch more water. If we think about it like that, the barrel is as big as it is. It holds the volume that it holds. But when something is sloped, you have that pressure that goes down um, and that helps. When you do not have a roofing structure in your garden, there are other ways to still increase the pressure to make sure that water is flowing at a faster rate and filling up your barrels. Um, I wanted to point that out, but I mentioned it to say location and where you put your barrel the elevation you put your barrel at, if it's next to a structure, all are things that are gonna contribute to the success of your rainwater harvesting system. Size and number of barrels. Like I said, a barrel is as big as it gets. It holds as much volume as it gets. Um, in a lot of spaces, folks connect barrels. Um, and so then you're increasing the amount of water that you can keep in your garden and hold in your system um, if you place a connector between them. If that's something you're considering, there are so many plans out there, I'm not gonna make a recommendation, but I will suggest that you're mindful about where you put that connector. Is it directly in the middle of the barrels? Is it a little bit higher? Because you wanna wait for each barrel to fill up before it fills up the next one. Is it lower because you wanna fill up the last one first and see how it flows through your system? All of these things are what you would consider when building a rain barrel or purchasing a rain barrel. Um, the next thing that I wanna kind of point out is surface area. So again, we're thinking about faster filling. Um, and so it's gonna be faster if you increase the surface area. And in the image on the right upper hand side, you see these two weird fan looking thingies, the little discs at the top. Those are considered rainwater harvesting saucers and they extend that surface area, right? So now you're not, think about it as you have two miniature roofs that are funneling and using that pressure to go down and fill your system faster. Um, these are, you can purchase them, you can makeshift them, um, but they are available and they, usually the building material that they use for rainwater harvesting saucers is safer than some commercially available roofing material. So if you're like, I don't wanna build a structure, but I wanna get the benefit, saucers are a really great option. Um, and the way that they're packaged and usable is really simple to use. So that's, that's a really good option for you. Another thing to consider when you have standing water in a garden is contamination, but also pests. So we know that mosquitoes uh, live their life in water. Um, part of it at least, and that's a major pest. So to reduce the likelihood of mosquitoes nesting, definitely consider putting a lid on the rain barrel and using a wire mesh. The wire mesh will not only protect against mosquitoes entering your system, but also any large debris that could, when added to the water, create other types of issues, nasty bacteria, microorganisms living in there. Um, so, Definitely management practices are important. Um, so the lids help, the wire mesh helps. Um, another thing that helps with reducing contamination and making the water usable in your garden would be cleaning out the barrel at the beginning and the end of the season. So just making sure that everything is sterilized in there. Another tip would be to select a dark color. If you're purchasing a barrel or paint, the barrel darker color um, because that helps lower the risk of an algal bloom or algae growing in your rain barrel. Okay, next slide. Um, Michaela, there were a couple questions about this point in particular um, mm -hmm. about like whether it's safe to use rainwater with a vegetable garden. Um, do you need to do any kind of purification? Do you want to talk about that before we move on or is that coming up? Oh, you, it is coming up. up. Never, it's coming up. Okay. <laughs> it's coming up. And if 
if I'm again like this is the broad overview we only have an hour I, I do have some contact information and some additional resources for all of you listeners um and so we're going to talk about that right now um oh one tip that I forgot when I was talking about location um was that as you elevate your gravity is the only thing helping rainwater enter your barrel right um, but if you elevate it, you can get more pressure. So a lot of things can help make your rainwater harvesting system more efficient. Um, things like the saucer, things like elevating it up. Um, a good kind of rule of thumb is to elevate it near a place where you know you're going to have access to it. So at that kind of level, maybe two, a foot to two feet off the ground so that for ease of use, so to have this big it up and so one can hand water or one can tie the pipe and easily connect it to your irrigation system. That's kind of the range that I would say to elevate it. That also helps add more water pressure to fill the barrel. Um, so using rainwater in the garden, the big, the big question, the drum roll question, can you use it? Is it safe to use on vegetables that you are going to eat in your garden? And you may not love this answer. It depends. It depends on a few things. It depends on how you're harvesting the rainwater. Again, some materials like growing materials. <laughs> Um, um, not growing materials, sorry, roofing materials do have contaminants that will leach out. And as it's going off that roofing surface, that can easily mess up your system. Um, another thing, so that's why a saucer would be a better option. Another thing to consider would be um, maybe not exactly using rain barrels for what rainwater. Start storage. Um, they could also be considered a tool. Um, a lot of the debate around um, using uh, rainwater harvest rainwater harvested for growing food that you're going to eat is that the idea that there's a lot of pollutants that already exist within the atmosphere and at certain concentrations can um, decrease or kill plant activity productivity over the long term. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, research that goes back and forth about whether or not it's at what concentration, um, what pollutants, a lot of the pollutants that are of concern are, um, enter the rainwater harvesting systems through like, um, through many different ways. Runoff is one, dust is one, thinking about ones that already exist in the atmosphere, um, thinking about aerosols, thinking about hydrocarbons, um, thinking about things that wash off, right, can easily get access into your system. Um, and a lot of the debate and a lot of that research and those studies come, they're a little bit dated. Um, the most recent resource that I found was out of the University of Arkansas, and they suggested that Yes, rain water is safest and best to use when you're growing plants, pollinators, flowers, um, thinking about other horticultural uses rather than growing veggies. However, they also mention that if you are going to use it to grow veggies, the main consideration is to put it directly at the soil level and not touch the, the plants to minimize risk of contaminants. So, you could use that for vegetable growing and be fairly safe. And the reason is because of soil health. If you have good soil health, things that will filter out through the system. Because um, if we think about it, rainwater is going to fall in our garden anyway. There's nothing we can do about that. But if you do maintain really good soil health, um, it can be less of a concern for you if you're maintaining a really clean rainwater harvesting system and you know the materials that you're using to build your system rather than just purchasing one on the market. These are all things that you can do to reduce your risk of contaminating your system and growing safe vegetables to eat. <laughs> so I say all that to say it depends on what you're going to pick as your rainwater harvesting practice as your rainwater harvesting system, 
whether or not you're going to have to treat the water. You don't have to treat the water because it's not potable, you're not going to drink it. And when you consider all the factors in agriculture, it can be perfectly fine to water your plants with rainwater, as long as you're keeping it at that soil level, thinking, think drip or trickle irrigation versus over water spraying. So I hope that might not be the best answer that everybody who's here, I can't even see participants actually. So thank you for, for uh, monitoring the chat, Mara. That might not be the answer that most folks wanted to hear, but most recently, the most of the recent data that I found is that yes, because, and here are all the different management practices to create the perfect way to incorporate that rainwater for growing fresh produce. Okay, next slide. So what does this look like in practice? Here are just some examples of irrigation systems that might work for you. So if you're looking um, on the left-hand side, that's kind of a classic system. It's, it's a system using PVC piping. It's definitely the drip or trickle system. Um, and it looks like it's not a tape system. So the tubing that they're using is a little bit more um, resilient, I'll say. That might not be the best word to describe it, but they're a little hardier and you know movable. So you might not get the same issues with like drip tape if you were considering putting that for cost reasons into your system. Um, and it's a, a little bit of a combination. I'm not sure where their access point is in this garden. Um, what type of water they're using, where they're getting it. But I do know that there has to be an access point further away and they might be using a combination of how they're watering these plants. On the right-hand side, another thing to consider, this picture was taken at Hill Street Garden in Staten Island um, and they have really high elevation to kind of help with that flow, right? Um, I will tell you that they're, closed most of the time. So there's a lid on those barrels, except for when they're opening it up. And you can see here that the irrigation system that they have going on here isn't going directly into a bed. Instead, they're tapping a fire hydrant nearby, putting that in the PVC piping system. So the PVC pipe can fill multiple rain barrels at once. Then they're sealing the barrel and storing that water for use. What this system does is it allows them to only have to tap once during the week and they'll have water to sustain the garden, a lot of water to sustain the garden for a while. Um, it really reduces the risk of contaminants because they're using it kind of as a storage unit. And then as you can see a little bit in the picture, there's a lot of like hand watering tools that they use. Um, Moreover, they could opt at that little spigot right there to put a hose if they wanted to improve and create like a drip irrigation system to make it go further. But that's a really good use um, of the rain barrel and a really good use to get municipal water into your garden in a different access way, um, make it more accessible. Because um, like we said, Hill Street is a really good example of having a hydrant that's really far away this is a really good solution that I wanted to share with you. So shout out to those gardeners who built this amazing system. Um, they're also incredible. So if you have a moment to volunteer, I'm gonna always shout out Hill Street, they're awesome. Okay. So here's just the list of um, some New York City resources. Um, if you have question about rainwater harvesting systems, you can reach out to um, to get more information. Um, there is a little part after this. Again, Alex is going to talk about the hydrants in more detail. Um, so that will be super helpful for if that's the route that you all are planning to go or have already access to other agencies to consider, as well as myself um, and members of my team, consider us all local resources to help you troubleshoot some of these these challenges you may occur. Um, I do want to shout out that DEP also does barrel giveaways. So the photo in here is a photo from a barrel giveaway. So if you're like looking for resources, looking for something already built, a nice color choice there, that's one resource for you. Okay, next slide. Oh, okay. So that wraps up my section of the webinar. 
Um, on this slide is my um, my contact information. Should you want to get a hold of me? Um, I also provided a link that I think Morris put in the chat that has some um, research behind some of the things that I mentioned today, um, and also some um, additional like resources around extension, how to build a system. Because I know I didn't touch that. Um, so yeah, reach out if you need any more. There's definitely articles that I've read that I didn't list on that sheet um, that might be really specific to your situation. And I can, I can walk you through that or provide access in any way that you need moving forward. Um, but with that, thank you for your attention. And I'm gonna turn it over to Alex to talk about gaining access to municipal water from fire hydrants. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, Alex is up next. And I just wanna say if folks still have questions from Michaela's presentation, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll hold on to all questions and, and do that at the end, but I wanna make sure you guys get this info. Thank you, Mara, and good afternoon. My name is Alex Munoz. I'm the Assistant Director of Community Engagement here at NYC Parks Green Thumb. All 550 community gardens that are registered with us, as well as the school gardens that are registered with Grow NYC School Gardens are eligible for a free hydrant permit through our cooperation with the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, who provides our safe, clean drinking water for the city. Next slide. So what I'm not going to cover today is the physical mechanics of how you link up to the hydrant, but that is our very own Eric Toman, our Central and South Brooklyn Community Engagement Coordinator. We've got a wonderful YouTube video. You'll see there the link to bit.ly gt underscore hydrant video. It walks you through all the steps, the different pieces you need. And if you are one of our registered gardens, you are able to also get the uh, hydrant adapter, spray cap, and a wrench as needed through your community engagement coordinator. Uh, you should already be in touch with them. And if you're not, I'll drop my email in the chat to connect you. That's for all 550 of those community gardens. And if you're a Grow NYC school garden, you can touch base with Laura on that side as well about those steps. So again, that video is wonderful. I highly encourage you to watch it for all the mechanics of how to link up to the hydrant. Next slide. So the paperwork part is what I'm covering today. There's a multi-step process for our friends at Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, on how to request a hydrant permit application. If you're already one of our 550 registered community gardens, you should have received, uh, your primary contacts with the garden should have received monthly emails from our community engagement coordinators. Our March and April e-blast included a bunch of PDF attachments, including DEP hydrant permit application instructions and a copy of the permit itself itself. If you're a member of a registered school garden, you'll be receiving that from Grow NYC directly. So next slide, and I'm going to show um, what a copy of the permit looks like. There it is. This one is with my name and one of my favorite close gardens down in Brooklyn, the Newkirk Community Garden. That's a garden on private property. They too are eligible for registering with us as a community garden. So there are three key numbers that DEP is going to need this year and going forward. The first one is a UMAX account number. You'll see that highlighted in the bottom left there. That will be on last year's copy of the permit. If you don't have that available and your community engagement coordinator is not able to help you locate that UMAX number, you can email that communitygardens at dep.nyc.gov and they will one time be able to look up that number and provide it to you. That's one of the reasons we're asking all gardens, when you get the permit, please keep a copy of it, send it to your community engagement coordinator, we'll add it to our database. That way, if there's a change in garden leadership, we'll have it as a reference point but that, that UMAX number is part of their new system and absolutely key. The second number that they will be looking for is your hydrant number. You can find that of two ways, either the base of the hydrant or opendata.cityofnewyork.us has a free website searchable map. If you have any trouble navigating it, our staff here at Green Thumb, your community engagement coordinator, who's your first point of contact for our registered community gardens, they can guide you through how to look that up on the map or just look it up for you and tell you what that hydrant number is. And that hydrant number is 
is going to be uh, particular and unique to the hydrant that your garden is using and the, the hydrant that your garden will be authorized through the permit. The third number will be provided. That's the permit number that is also unique that they'll give you once they issue the permit. Next slide, please. And this is the second um, uh, bottom half of the permit application itself. You'll see lines for block and lot, which you can look up there at gis.nyc.gov. Register community gardens at Green Thumb. You also, again, can ask your community engagement coordinator. And if you've done the license process with us as a garden on parks property, it's already on that license paperwork if you want to refer to that as well. Um, address is self-explanatory. You can see the name of the owner is the person who uh, is requesting that permit. They need to know an actual New York resident um, to connect that account to. UMAX number, again, is the same UMAX number that we talked about, and the DEP can provide that once. Uh, if you can't find it from a previous permit copy or you're not able to get that from the community engagement coordinator. All community gardens have to have a vacuum breaker. It's currently listed as an RPZ that can be self-supplied or DEP can provide that, especially if you're doing a walk-in uh, pickup for these. Uh, that uh, Next slide, Mayor. Um, well, you're going to be sending that application in. I'll get back to the vacuum breaker in a second. All the applications go into Queen's permits at dp.nyc.gov. If you're doing it online, you can also do walk-in hours at, and DEP has a borough office in each of the boroughs as well. Happy to follow up via your community engagement coordinator if you're having any trouble locating what those borough offices are. And they will send you both a hard copy and an online copy of that permit once it's done. And again, we ask, please do try to keep a laminated copy of that hydrant permit in your garden's tool shed, your binder, or garden records, or anything else like that. And ideally, please share it with us. That way we can save a digital copy on our end. We know there's often an ebb and flow to community garden groups, and we'd love to help out as far as being the repository of some of those key documents, especially so that uh, those are available for a changeover in leadership, a changeover in membership, or anything happens. Next slide. Rules and regu uh, regulations, vacuum breakers. So again, these are the key item. We formally refer to them always as RPZs. They help keep the they prevent backflow from happening to keep our drinking water safe for the over 8 million New Yorkers who use them. Um, they can be purchased at plumbing supply stores. You can also borrow one directly from DEP, and Green Thumb is sometimes able to give them out directly. Again, you can ask your community engagement coordinator about those. They're often referred to as an RPZ or a vacuum breaker or a backflow preventer. Temperature limitations. Hydrant uh, use is prohibited when the temperature drops 32 degrees or below. So DEP is on the same cycle for hydrant access that we're on. They're aware of the community garden calendar. Uh, and as it runs from um, April 1st to October 31st, perhaps climate change will lengthen that in the future. So stay tuned on that. And then just some additional rules, regulations, and inspections. Uh, we are in partnership with DAP on this, so we're obligated to follow all the rules uh, required as far as hydrant usage. They do try to monitor and, and do will put on custodial and magnetic caps. They find that a hydrant is being illegally used for, say, car washing or some sort of other commercial business use. The free permit is not for that. There can be fines if they find that uh, somebody is illegally using a hydrant in that sort of matter, and they can revoke the permit as well by authorization of their commissioner. So we do ask that community gardens just use it only for community gardening and all of its gardening activities and not use the permit for anything uh, inappropriate. Next slide. And if you still need help, because oftentimes there can be little bumps in the paperwork processing, they have established a joint uh, mailbox, this community gardens at dep.nyc.gov. You can ask them about assistance for hydrant cap removals. That includes both those magnetic caps and those custodial caps. Sometimes they'll hear about a complaint of someone running a car wash. It might be near a community garden. So they want to try to cut back on that illegal illicit behavior, but they also want to make sure the garden group has access. So community gardens at dep.nyc.gov will be able to troubleshoot for those cap requests. They'll also be able to follow on 311 service requests, including if a hydrant is leaking, running at full blast, completely broken, etc. We ask that you put in that 311 first and then share it with that community gardens at DEP address. They can also help uh, troubleshoot the permit application status if you are emailed uh, that Queen's DEP address and you're still waiting for a response, they can follow up on that. And they can also address your general questions as well. And I think that's my last slide.
ah, of course not. Nope, it's not. We have the important pieces of material, the visual close-up. And again, I encourage all of you, I'm once again asking you to watch that YouTube with, starring Eric Toman, who walks you through exactly how to use all these different items. So you'll see the hydrant wrench, the hose adapter, and what's also the vacuum breaker slash RPZ. It's a wonderful video. Mr. Toman does an excellent job walking people through exactly how you connect that into which part of the hydrant, et cetera. It's great watching and you can pause and rewind and watch at your leisure and make sure that everyone in your community garden that might be accessing that hydrant knows exactly how to do so. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I've seen some garden groups make like a little laminated QR code to that YouTube video and put it in their tool shed so that whoever's hooking up the hydrant has easy access to our instructional video. I recommend that um, if folks are, are learning, if you have new members and folks are learning. We do have a question in the chat, Alex, and if the answer is that we don't know, then I'll ask this person to follow up with me directly and I'll find an answer. We are not a community garden, but a volunteer group with partnerships for parks working at a city park. We have filled out the same application, but DEP is asking for a letter from parks that states that this is in fact a no fee project, um, but we haven't been able to obtain that letter yet. Any suggestions on how to push this along? Unfortunately, my answer is I don't know for that. I do know DEP previously, many years ago, well, not many, maybe five years ago, was supporting groups exactly like this, as well as through the stu super stewards project process. So I had the feeling some of the paperwork and uh, partnerships have fallen off a little bit, but that's something that, Maris, like Maris said, um, you can follow up with her directly and we can see about making some connections. Next question, do you have to inform the nearby fire station about your hydrant use? Uh, no, you do not have to, but I encourage all community gardens to make friends with your fire stations. You never know. They're good people to know. Um, they can be very useful in terms of open flame permits or anything else, or just in case something comes up. Uh, I think that's more of a legacy sort of thing. They do and can help with like doing spray cap caps, including for sprinklers for when it gets absurdly hot in the summertime as well. But DEP is who we work through for the official hydrant permits. Thank you. All right, folks, do folks have any other questions for Michaela or Alex? If I could what? just kind of make a little suggestion that as um, as I was sitting here thinking about, again, there was a lot of hesitance with using rainwater for vegetable production. And again, like there's a lot of considerations with that. But um, uh, Alex was talking and mentioned the season. I definitely would recommend at the beginning of the season, meaning after the first Ross, giving your cyst, like your barrel and your connectors and all of that a really nice clean um, to get ready for the season. And then at the end of it, whenever you're going to close your garden doors, doing the same process and storing the barrel, you don't have to keep it out. If you do want to, for like, again, the environmental benefits to capture that water, emptying out the standing water to start fresh and new will um, go ahead and make the system um, safer to use. Great, well, I wanna thank Michaela so much for this partnership. This was a really, really great session, super informative, very concise, we're five minutes early. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and then I'll open up the settings so folks can unmute and chat with you directly for five more minutes if folks wanna stick around. Um, and thank you, Alex, for presenting Green Thumb Policy around hydrant access. And thank you all for tuning in on your, your lunch hour, presumably. Thank you, everyone.